Welcome everyone to this second of our three year-ending Green New Deals webinars. Again, thank you, Peter Scherf. Uh, all of us at Marine Money wish you and all of yours a happy holiday season and a safe end to this traumatic year. The shipping industry has made great strides towards meeting global emission reduction targets, but more needs to be done to reach the 2050 goals. And while zero carbon fuels remain the future option, they are still just that, a future. And Christopher Rex at Danish Ship Finance November Shipping Market Review wrote, imagine a situation where leading players across industries, including the shipping space, agree to guarantee an extraordinarily large uptake of a zero carbon fuel. Such a commitment would allow zero carbon fuel producers to super scale production end to end bringing that day closer to fruition and reality. But we have a near-term challenge while that vision develops, which is all about what do vessels and ship owners do now? The industry has invested in modernizing vessels through retrofits and introduction of new technologies, both onshore and onboard vessels. These actions are vital near-term steps to cutting emissions, but they are often handled by individual ship owners on a ship-by-ship -ship basis. Our fragmented asset base limits the ability to introduce large scale refurbishment programs to extend the lives of existing vessels. Nonetheless, retrofitting existing vessels to lower their emissions continues to represent an attractive business case, especially compared with the commercially suicidal do nothing approach. The ambition of a zero carbon future is very inspiring, but how do we nurture the first spark? How do we finance it? We are privileged today to have with us to present a vision that aims to identify how ships as asset class can reemerge as an attractive investment opportunity as they evolve to a zero carbon future. Some of the best and most creative minds in our industry join us next. But before I introduce our first presentation, I would like to invite the audience to make sure that they submit questions via the GoToWebinar chat box, which will you, see, you will see on your screens. We'll collect all of these questions and have a full Q&A session following our second presentation from Wartzilla. Now for Dr. Arlie Sterling, whom we all know as the face and leader at Marsaw. Here now to introduce his new self. Arlie, over to you. Thank you very much. Jim, thanks so much for the opportunity to, uh, uh, to come uh, to before this crowd and, and update the team on what we've been doing with Marsoft CleanCo. Uh, we talked about uh, this uh, several months ago, uh, our, our ideas and our program, and we've made a lot of progress uh, since that time, got a great response. So I'm gonna be sharing some of the, that uh, progress in, in this presentation. Uh, John, let's go straight to the, the next slide. You know, I, I, I promised everyone that I was going to make sure that every presentation I included in, in 2020 highlighted this extraordinary achievement that our industry has already put into the books. The elimination of a seven-fold reduction in sulfur emissions that the industry achieved uh, this year uh, with the IMO 2020 regulations is an extraordinary accomplishment, something that we need to take, make sure that the rest of the world knows about, knows that when we talk about emissions, we're not only talking about greenhouse gases, we're talking about sulfur. And that had an immediate and tangible impact on the world. There are 75,000 people, according to IMO estimates, that are enjoying longer and healthier lives as a result of the industry's action. So what, when I take a look at what we're doing now, talking about greenhouse gases, I really see it as part of the momentum of the industry to clean up its act, to deliver 90% of world trade, at an ever lower price, both in terms of the cost of transportation and the burden that we impose uh, in delivering those services on the environment. Now, I'm going to talk uh, in more detail about retrofits, as, as Jim suggested. So, so, John, if you could take me there. First of all, of course, it's, it's a good idea to understand what the word retrofit means. Uh, retrofit kind of has a, is an ever-growing topic, as, as I've, I've discovered. Uh, because there's so much innovation, so much exciting new stuff being done by the engineers and the naval architects to, 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 for our industry. But I'm going to talk about something relatively simple. As, as, as Jim emphasized, 
we know what works now. And, and so when I talk about retrofits, I'm going to talk about engine tuning, propeller optimization, energy saving devices, bow reshaping. These are the tools of the trade. They're well known, with proven technology to, to work with, and they're getting better. We're seeing manufacturers are introducing new and better options to each of these alternatives that are being able to deliver what mean more productivity, more efficiency at lower cost. But whenever we start talking about retrofitting, whenever we start talking about a ship owner investing in a ship or her ship, excuse me, before the charter moves, we have to recognize that the industry's experience with retrofitting has not been a happy one in general. Uh, we're still hearing about the disaster that was ballast water treatment and the extraordinary burden that was imposed on ship owners without any tangible return and frankly, without the technology working. We've seen the successful scrubber story, but we all know the backstory to that. There was $11 billion spent on scrubbers and, and still being spent on scrubbers. Probably the cost should have been about half of that if the industry had been able to time its, its, its uh, implementation process more efficiently and plan ahead and, and, and recognize that the putting these, these complex devices on board a ship was not gonna be an easy task. So we've got to learn from these experiences and, and that's what we've done with Marsoft Clean Cup. And uh, as I told people back in, in September, we've really pivoted our company, Marsoft, around the notion of, of greenhouse gas reduction, decarbonization of the shipping industry but focused very specifically on how we achieve that goal profitably, profitably for the owner, so we can be sure that they're making, that they have the incentives to take the investment that we know the industry needs in order to move at large scale. So I'm gonna talk, let's talk a little bit more in detail now about how we're gonna take that menu of options and turn it into profitability, profitable investments for owners. John, the next slide, please. So we've, as part of our process in, in talking to leading owners and technical managers and, and, and influencers in the industry, we've worked through a series of case studies very specifically to focus on what do you do for a, uh, a particular ship and, and focus, again, there are, as we'll talk about a little bit later, every, almost every ship is unique out there. One in four uh, uh, is, is uh, unique in any case. And so we need to drill down to very specific ships. And this specific case study is done for a Supermax, about a 2012, I think, Supra. Um, so it's one of the largest uh, class of ships out there. And it's a small ship, and that's very important because it's these smaller ships which really dominate the potential market here. Now, to join, uh, our, uh, to take advantage of, of Marsoft services, we've, as I say, established Marsoft Clean Co. And the way you join is you become a member of the Marsoft Clean Co. Club, a membership, as you see here. Uh, and that's going to cost you $50,000 over a course of a five year survey cycle, or about $10,000 a year. Now, what do you get in return for that? And, and this is the exercise we've gone through. Uh, again, for many different ships and, and, and talking with players about how to actually deliver this. Turns out that $50,000 investment, that saves you across the board in terms of time and risk reduction, taking the initial decision, saves you money in terms of the capital expense and the cost of capital to invest in the, in the retrofits, and it provides a new source of revenue through the carbon credits. And, and we heard just on Monday how important that carbon credit market can be and other areas, uh, we in fact can issue carbon credits with a retrofit approach as, that was developed at Marsoft Clean Co. And issuing those credits provides a substantial incremental, potentially substantial incremental source of, of, of revenue. Now the numbers are really, really large here. The numbers in terms of, of savings, there's more than a, a million dollars saved over a five year cycle uh, once you account for the, the fuel consumption as well as the cost savings. I'd like to point out, that the key is, in fact, what we're going to be doing in terms of extending the life of the existing ships. Now, this currently is more an option for bulkers and container ships than it is for tankers. But the fact is, any five more years of life from an existing vessel versus a new building is an extraordinarily profitable, good deal. If you can get the business for the ship, if you can perform competitively, then 
that valuation for this supermax is an $8 million value. So the incentives appear large. And of course, for $50,000, everyone should be a member of, of Marsoft Cleanco's uh, uh, club. I'll let you keep thinking about that one, but let's go on to the next slide. So what do you get when you join our, our the Marsoft Cleanco club? There are two key things. One is we call it the green screen. That's the first step. That's the step in which you take a look at your specific ship and we run that through models that we've developed. We're gonna talk about those shortly and look in detail about the performance improvements, the cost savings and the profitability of an investment in retrofits. Now, this is a presentation and analysis you take to the board. We appreciate the, the, the detailed engineering requirements that are necessary to go to do this. We've covered those and in order to, to move it forward to the board level and understand and get the decision making at, at that level. So we're focusing on the financial and environmental and, and operational factors that allow you to make a quick decision. And you know, everyone I've talked to who's gone through this business about retrofitting their ships says that they've already spent two months and talked to three experts in a, in a bidding process that, that can take a long time and simply gets more confusing as it goes forward. This process takes days, focuses on details that you need, as I say, to take that key financial uh, uh, case forward. Furthermore, you get access to the MCC supplier network. These are suppliers who have, in return for a commitment that MCC will deliver at scale and standardization of the retrofits, they've, they've found ways to reduce the cost. And obviously, if you can produce 50 of these, you call it energy, whatever uh, you choose to do, instead of one, you're going to be able to spread engineering cost and time and, and do planning to get to scale and reduce costs. Furthermore, as part of the exercise, because we're going to focus right up front on getting those carbon credits, we're going to ensure that there's performance monitoring capabilities in place that are accepted by the carbon credits market. But that also means that you can see how well these retrofits are performing. And in the process, we're going to organize up that pipeline into the carbon credit origination business. We heard on Monday that that is a rapidly growing industry. I think uh, we've got an $8 billion target on that from uh, Mark Carney. And I want to be sure that, that shipping is firmly plugged into that and realizing the premium pricing. Now, we're not trying to replace the experts. In, contra in complete contrast, we are trying to complement and bring together and partner with the experts that are necessary to do this. Our particular role, I think, is understanding the business case and understanding how to make it successful at scale. So we're talking with class, we're talking with OEMs, talking with the experts on the carbon credit markets to make all this happen, to partner for success. Collaboration is key in this industry very unusual in shipping, but we think we can make it happen. Next slide, please, John. So let me talk a little bit about two of the unique features of, of, of uh, MCC. First of all is our green screen. This is a model that we developed jointly with the MIT Sea Grant Lab that takes advantage of the, the years of research and analysis and hydrodynamics and tank testing that are out there in the world that allow us to actually create a ship. We can take with 20 parameters that describe your ship, ones that you have off your shelf. We can take those parameters, we can build the ship in, 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 in our model, and we can put the retrofits on it and see how they perform. And we can do that with 95% accuracy. That's what we, we have been able to show when we compare our model to the sea trial data. And that's something that uh, we'd be happy to, we of course, share with the clients as we go through this process. Now, let me talk about how that works for you and the incredibly important financial implications of this. The chart on the right shows three curves. The red curve is that Supra that's a, that started out, this, excuse me, this is a 2004. I think I misspoke earlier when I said it was a more recent ship. That's a 2004 vintage Supra. That's the consumption of fuel along the vertical axis at speed along the horizontal axis. And so we've recreated the main engine fuel consumption curve here. And again, we validated that curve against sea trial data for that ship. The two other curves, the green dash curve, that's what that's a modern eco ship that is probably a little bit bigger, probably a little different design. But the key is 
it is designed to deliver those ecoship benefits. And we all know the number 15 to 20%, that's achievable. Uh, we've seen these numbers. But the critical thing is to see the blue line. That's what you can do if you trick out that vintage Supra to deliver the, a more efficient uh, uh, engine, uh, uh, fine tune the engine, put in the stators, optimize the propeller. You are achieving 90 to 100% of the potential gains that an eco ship can provide. You're changing the competitive profile of that ship to deliver at the same cost as a ship 15 years younger can do. Yeah, that's where we think the economic argument can be made very powerful. And the key is, this is not manufacturer's hype. This is the model that we work be, developed with MIT because we're concerned that getting the numbers right, accurate, being objective about this is key. And we can talk in endless detail to naval architects and marine engineers how it works. Be happy to do that in some other session. Next slide, please, John. What's the other key aspect of, of how Marsoft Cleanco is going to deliver profitability to the shipping industry? Scale. Scale, standardization, that's going to allow us to channel to the OEMs and the others the scale they need to lower their costs. And now we're getting a unique insight into the shipping industry and, and this is something that I think Marsoft uh, has, is, reflects the investment that we've made over the years uh, in, 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 with our banking clients to help them to deliver the kind of profitable portfolio of shipping loans that they need to stay in the business. We can take a look at the numbers of sister ships in Poseidon Bank's signatories portfolio. Now, this is an estimate. Of course, the, the data is, is confidential, and so we've blurred the lines here so you cannot see anything specific. It's our estimate based on publicly available information about, what's, uh, about the composition of these portfolios. Take a look at the along the vertical axis, which I see, unfortunately, I haven't uh, put the label here. That's the number of ships that are of, uh, in each size class. Along the horizontal axis, I've shown you how we're breaking this out. We take a look at the engine, we take a look at the shipyard, and of course, the size of the ship, the nature and, and, and type of ship. And we're looking at ships now here that are going to be going through their second special survey over the next five years. If you take a look on, on the left there, the furthest left, we see that the Supra and Ultramax class built at Yangzhou Diang with a man BW engine, you can see the specs up there, that corresponds to 60 ships in that size class alone. And then go along here, we've taken the first 10 or 12, that corresponds to about 20% of the bank's portfolio that we've been able to look at. Now what that tells you is that you can tap into scale in the bank's portfolio, and it's the banks now who can look to this and say, well, We've created a challenge for shipping, a good challenge, the Poseidon principles, the path towards decarbonization. How are they going to help to achieve that decarbonization, that trajectory of continuous improvements? Well, you start by looking at those clusters. Where are the similar ships that allow you to deliver lower cost? How can you now move forward to the owners with a financing package that makes sure that the, the decision is, as we say, a no-brainer? Next slide, please, John. Now, carbon credits are an emerging market. This is something we know is going to be an $8 billion market going forward. It's a market that's going to change the dynamics of the business. We heard about how already it's being used in, in, in the, uh, by some leading owners and, and, and both in liner companies and the bulk business to reduce the carbon profile of their transportation services. Some of the key things that we need to, to emphasize about what we're doing in shipping is that we're offering permanent abatement. You put an energy saving device on a ship and it's there forever, life of the ship. That means that it's going to be operating continuously and to deliver that lower those greenhouse gas emissions. I think we have to push this argument a bit that we may be able to, to get credit for the deferred new building programs. That is a removal of what would otherwise be in addition to the, the greenhouse gases. Remember, building a ship emits a lot of CO2. It accounts for about a year and a half, two years, maybe more of the carbon emitted in the routine operations of the ship. And that's got to, that is not currently uh, part of the Poseidon principles calculation, but it is part of every 
Paris Accord calculation that looks to a net zero concept of, of, of through the life cycle of a ship. Now, what we've got to do in shipping is make sure that we, in, with our carbon credits, we, we achieve this charismatic quality that, that we heard a little bit about uh, on, on Monday. Right now, carbon credit from an offshore windmill, a, a, a wind turbine in India is maybe $5 a ton, maybe three. Uh, in Europe, the same carbon trades in a different market at what is currently $35 a ton. Now, optimizing that revenue is something that is going to take some careful look at the intricacies of the carbon market. When we heard, again, I think how complex that is and how over-the-counter, non-standardized these contracts are. This is an investment we're making to ensure that ship owners will get the greatest they can, the greatest price they can. John, next slide, please. Let me talk a little bit about why we're excited about this, why we think it's an opportunity both for the industry and, and something that Marsoft is going to be able to, to use to scale up its business. There are 18,000 ships out there that can benefit from these retrofits. If you take a look at all ships that are going through their second, third, and fourth special survey over the next five years, and over the next five years, we can have a, an impact over the next five years. We don't have to wait till 2030. Now, the fact is crew tankers are not now considered a retrofit option for reasons that I think date back to open 90. Uh, it's hard to get employment for a tanker over 20 years old, very hard. It's maybe hard over 15. So I think that's gonna change. I think it has to change as, as the tanker industry realizes the, the costs that they're imposing by limiting the life of their tankers. But let's take them out and do these calculations on a much smaller sample. Let's, let's take 8,000 because I think that's the, a number that, that is not so outrageously lar large for, for people to hear. These are our prime targets. Two thirds of those are MRs and Supras and, and Handys. Now that really points out the challenge. In order to get economically viable investments on these small ships, we have to recognize those main engines are burning 24 tons per day. This is not a CAPE. This is not a VLCC. It's not a, it's not a big, fast container ship. They're already very efficient. So we really have to focus on making the decision-making process clean and simple in the investments as at minimum cost. But once we take it down to 8,000 ships, somewhere between 12 and 16 billion dollars of retrofits are going to be done over the next five years if we can do this right and we're going to deliver substantial reductions in co2 emissions emissions that amount to ballpark half of what norway or greece emit every year so even if we focus just on these old old ladies the ones that really frankly are the core profitable business of the shipping industry we can deliver more profitability we can deliver substantial greenhouse gas emissions reductions, and we can extend the life of those ships so we can defer a new building program, a new building program that the industry, frankly, has not always done very successfully. And of course, we don't know how the what fuels are going to run those new ships. So that's what Marsoft Clean Co is doing to help save the environment. And uh, we are joining with our, our customers around the world to deliver this. And happy to talk more with you about it going forward. It's, great way uh, uh, for us to, to, to grow our business and, and we're tremendously excited about it. Jim, thank you so much for your time. Hey. Arlie, Arlie, thank you very much. Uh, and it's enormously exciting for us to hear about, for the, uh, the industry to hear about, and, and frankly, for the, uh, the, the world to hear about. And I know that at Marine Money, we, you know, we are huge supporters, as, as you, you well know, uh, of the initiative, and I know that um, the, the team over at High Tide, who were supportive of the MIT effort, uh, are as well. Um, now, it is a huge pleasure for me to switch from Arley, and I will remind all our audience, if they could, just uh, continue to put in questions, and we'll field all of those at the end. So, Arley, you have a, a small minute to uh, collect your, uh, your thoughts and, and rest up, because now I'm going to bring in Kevin Humphreys and John Hatley, who are the general managers of Market Innovation, which is a proper title for these two very creative gentlemen for Wartzilla Inc., the leading OEM and technology company in the maritime industry. They are indeed the Batman and Robin of shipping, a true dynamic duo. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, I'm just Jim. not sure who's Batman and Robin, so we're gonna have to we're <laughs> gonna have to settle settle that. So Great, John, go ahead and uh, next slide, John.
Great. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, it's real exciting for us to be part of uh, Marine Money. Uh, we love what they're doing and, and facilitating these discussions about how the industry can reduce its carbon emission, but do it in a way that is uh, financially viable as well. So a few of the things we want to talk about today, just real briefly, what again are the Poseidon principles, uh, the measure for compliance, because that's really a key metric for how we're going to make decisions in the future. What are those decision points that we're going to face as owners and, and vessel lenders? What are some of my options? Uh, what can I do to these vessels to bring them into compliance? We're going to have a real brief case study just to illustrate this for you. I think it's going to be really interesting for you. And then a little bit on how we at Wartzilla can help you uh, with this retrofit process. Uh, next slide, John. So the Poseidon principles, just to refresh everybody, we're uh, now 18 large uh, shipping lending banks established in June 2019. Um, and they're currently holding about $150 billion portfolio in the maritime industry of, of assets. And the real key things are transparency and accountability. What is the industry doing as far as the emissions of these loan portfolios? And I like to say they're, they're walking the talk on climate change. Um, they wanted to be a leader. They wanted to get ahead and they wanted to facilitate and collaborate with owners and other members of the industry to improve the emissions profile. And, and that's really what Poseidon Principle is all about. Uh, next slide, John. So this is a, a key metric, and I think it's important just to touch on it. And so in the Poseidon Principles, the vessels are ranked on what's called the average efficiency ratio. Fairly simple ratio of the size of the vessel, the dead weight tons, the distance it covers in a given year, and the total carbon emissions. But it's a very key metric, simple but key metric for what we're going to be talking about going forward. And it's really key for owners to know where they stand on this AER metric. Next slide, John. So where are we on compliance? Well, we've done some early analysis. The 2019 results are still pending. We expect them uh, any, any week now. Uh, but what we are seeing is that most of the vessels in the fleets are above the AER limit lines. Some are around compliance, either slightly above or slightly below, and the, and the rest are within compliance. But the real key is that in the future, the metrics are going to keep getting tighter. So this isn't going to get easier. It's going to get tougher for owners to stay in compliance. Uh, next slide, John. So one of the first key points that you need to understand uh, with your fleets is where is my AER fallout? In other words, when do my vessels begin to not perform under the standard of AER emissions? So we look on this graph, we have our AER is on the vertical axis, the years of the vessel life. We've used 25 years for the sake of these examples to illustrate the life of the vessels. And so when does that vessel fall out? Because that's gonna trigger your decisions Either it's already fallen out and I'm hitting dry dock or I'm going to implement digital or I know it's going to fall out in the future and I need to make plans uh, because I'm dry docking now and I want to make those retrofits prior to it falling out in the next dry dock cycle. Uh, John, next uh, slide, please. And so if you do nothing, if you don't change your asset at all, you don't do any physical retrofits, you don't implement any digital retrofits and there are no few, uh, new future fuels in the pipeline, the only option then to lower your, your, your vessel AER mission and bring it back into compliance is to slow the vessel. And that's what we see illustrated here. So in this particular case, the vessel falls out in the first month of 2018, and then it needs to then start slowing down in order to reduce its AER. Now, there's an interesting phenomena out in the future of these vessels that as the vessel covers less and less miles, the parasitic loads of import, of cargo moving, of ballast loads, of your hotel loads become a larger percentage of your overall fuel burn. So we actually see in the future where your AER score will start getting worse. However, this is probably long past the time this vessel will be useful to the logistics chains, and, and my colleague John Halley is going to touch on that later. Uh, next slide, uh, John. So one of the key things we need to think about then when we think about that speed reduction is when we're making our investment decisions today, we're talking about two very different future cash flow options. And so if I do nothing, I've got a vessel that has to slow down in order to, to achieve its AER compliance if I want to stay in the good graces of my banks. But now I have a vessel that is less useful to the logistics chain and, and less uh, likely to have utilization with the charters. Its fuel economy will be worse, its emissions profile will be worse. 
However, if I do retrofit or implement digital type solutions, I've now shifted out that AER runway and given me a longer time where that vessel will be uh, able to operate at full speed for the logistics chain and be a vessel that the charters are going to want to fix. So I've got a higher cash flow on average of those vessels. So we have to consider the fact that we're talking about two very different future cash flow options on average that we're going to bring back to the net present value today of what retrofit fit decisions we make. Next slide, John. And so what are the benefits then of making these retrofits and compliance? Well, number one, you're, you're staying in the good graces of the banks to not only get better rates and terms, but as uh, Hugo DeStoop, the CEO of Euronav, mentioned a few weeks back at another Marine Money Conference, it's becoming a gatekeeper for owners. Banks, Poseidon principal banks particularly, want to know that you are having aggressive environmental programs as a gatekeeper before they even talk about lending. So it's not only lending terms, it's access to finance in the first place. And then for the owners, you've got assets that are performing better, have higher net asset values and better utilization rates. And for the charters, you've got vessels with lower fuel burn, less cost for the charters, and easier compliance with your own charter uh, corporate social responsibility goals. Next slide, John. And of course, the exact opposite. If you do nothing and you opt for speed reductions to stay in the good graces of the bank, that's one option, or you can continue to operate at normal speeds and you're going to lose that access to the prime funding from the Poseidon principal banks uh, and your vessels are going to be less useful to the charters, which are going to impact your cash flows and your net asset values. Again, a very vicious cycle down in the future from a financial standpoint. Very often in our models, forcing a relatively early scrapping of that vessel as far as its economic life. Uh, next slide, John. So we're gonna to come to this decision point as far as the AER fallout. So what can I do? Well, there's, there's a couple things. I can invest capital or in the sense of digital, which is a relatively low capital option and not a dry dock option, it can be done at any time. I'm either going to invest in some sense in that vessel or I'm not. That's really the two tough decisions that owners are going to have to make. And so what can they do when they're looking at the myriad of options out there for retrofits? Next slide, John. So I want to mention a couple. Again, Arlie had mentioned that we're looking for smart, reasonable, proven solutions. So the first one I want to mention is, is, is digital fleet solutions. And so Wartzilla's solution is the fleet operation solution. And this is a complete digital platform for the operation of vessels. Everything from energy management to chartering to commercial management. So it's a very robust tool. But one of the beauties of this system is it's a no capex system. It can be installed very quickly. It's just a, a couple hours in a major port and the system is in. And because it leverages the ECTUS information and very, very sophisticated computing power, you don't need the time and expense of flow meters, fuel meters, torque and thrust meters, and a lot of the other integration that some platforms need. So you can get up and running very quickly, very inexpensively. And the beauty of the system is all of the reporting that we're talking about can be done in an automated fashion. All of your Poseidon principal reporting and later as the industry develops the sea cargo charter compliance reporting. And everything it meets and exceeds all the ISO standards for this type of reporting using sophisticated computer power and algorithms. Next slide, John. The next solution are propulsion retrofits. Now these are simple, proven, it's a fairly well-known concept in the industry of flow devices. But pinging off what Arlie said earlier, the key is the volume is gonna enable us to do the engineering and prep work to design these flow devices at a cost competitive price and an effective price, particularly for smaller vessels. That's always been a challenge. It's, it's a little easier to make it work on a V or a Cape. It's been a bit of a challenge in the smaller, smaller vessels and we think we can overcome that for relatively robust uh, performance improvements on, on vessels. Next slide, John. And the last very simple retrofit, if you've got one of the 20 or so percent of vessels in the industry with Wartzilla, Sulzer engines, two-stroke engines, uh, there are a number of retrofits, particularly in the fuel injection and fuel system side that will improve performance, particularly as the engines are getting to about 10 years old. Or if you have an engine where you're running very consistently at slow speeds, there are slow speed kits to improve the performance. Again, these are simple known technologies that provide very robust uh, returns that are available to the industry now. Next slide, please, John. 
And so I want to leave you with this before I turn it over to John. It, historically speaking, when we look at a lot of those retrofits, we, we tend to focus on the payback of the retrofit. And it's not a bad measure. It does capture a certain picture. But the reality is today is that we need to have a much more robust analysis in the context of Poseidon principles. There's a lot more going on in the decisions I need to make as a CEO or a CFO of what retrofit programs do I take on my fleet. And so I want you to think back to that multiple cash flow challenge that I have. Do I, do I go with the low cash flow or the high cash flow options as far as my capital investment? And keep in mind this, what I'm calling payback beware. And I want to turn it over to my colleague, John Hatley, now for a case study that will illustrate why we need a new way of thinking about some of these technical solutions in the industry. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so as we begin, please stay with that slide for a moment, the previous slide. Yes, I think what's really important here to see is that payback addresses one question traditionally, how soon I get my money back? And there's several other things that need to be addressed more fully, which is the TCE, your possible gain in net asset value and returns on investment. But also in addition to this, we need to look at the environmental monetization. And as Arlie painted the picture earlier and, and so, so did Kevin, the carbon generated before and after, any savings you've accrued and those savings allow you to change your AER, average efficiency ratios, which translate into moving that fallout year farther out into the future so you can maintain higher competitive voyage speeds that the charters are looking at. So that extension is also important. So we can see that payback only answers one of at least eight or more key questions. Next slide, please. So as you look at a myriad of possible options to consider for retrofitting a vessel, one of the big confusions is what do we pick from several dozen options? And there's a way that maybe can utilize in, in looking at the relative emissions performance shown here on the x-axis against a relative set of costs on the vertical axis. And so you can put these efficiency upgrades in these two important key criterias as a combined way to look at it. And so on the lower right, you see the scale has a green box. This green box has those items of say several dozen, you got down to the last eight or nine to be evaluated that have above average performance and below average cost. There we've got the wake flow inducers that Kevin mentioned with a fairly strong performance on emissions reduction and hull paint, high performance hull paint and engine modifications for slow speed and blueprinting of the engine and fleet digital. In the upper left, you see a red box where you have below average performance at above average cost. There we see a host of other things that are probably uh, not going to be chosen to, to modify for your vessel. And loan out in the side, we see uh, wind rotors. These, these are fairly high cost, but also fairly high performance. So if you were a very cost conscious investor looking at good emissions reduction, you might choose fleet digital. You can see it's the lowest cost of the green box items and then elevate it uh, perhaps to the number one choice. Conversely, if you're looking at strong emissions despite cost, you then might consider the wind road or installation. Next slide. So the blue arrow shows the vessel beginning service in 2011, 25 years ending in 2036. So we see the horizontal scale in years here with the vertical scale with the AER and the dotted dashed line from left to lower right is the AER required score each of those years for that class of ship. And she fell out, the fallout in year 2018 and a month. So she then encountered speed reductions. So in 2021, next year, she'll be at 95% of the speeds. Continue rolling back her speeds to maintain AER compliance. 
So the charters may, may not be as happy with, with slower speed ships and pick the cleaner, faster ships first. Eventually, that ship hits a point where the charters may not tolerate further speed reductions and she gets retired earlier. As Kevin mentioned, the no capex crutch of speed reductions is competitive disadvantage, curtailed asset life, and wealth destruction. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here we see a deferral of the AER fallout because the vessel has implemented some capex expenditures to retrofit efficiency upgrades. And we see that with the green arrow showing the deferral. We are maintaining competitive speeds from 2018 approaching 2025 for seven years. And that is shown at the bottom of the scale where we show about a 19% efficiency improvement for those top four items that we selected out of the green box. Then the vessel will finally incur a speed reduction. But you notice that the deferral and the extended runway compliance for several years brings a lot of extra cash in. So you don't have a huge competitive disadvantage. Instead, you have a renewed asset life with wealth restoration. Let's go to the next slide, please. So now we can come back to the picture of what are the important metrics that the board, the CFO, the CEO, and the president have to look at. So beyond payback, in the traditional sense, we can see that the time chart equivalent for this MR tanker, vintage 2011, has gone up by 900 and some dollars per day. The S asset value has gone up by more than $2 million with a strong IRR and a very, very compelling profitability index. But even more importantly, we see environmental monetization, the metrics that have improved before and after. Before, the ship emitted over 20,000 tons of CO2 each year. It improved with the retrofit package to just over 17,000, which is a net reduction of over 3,000 tons of CO2 per year. Good for the environment and very good for your AER score, which was able to pull back and get closer to compliance, rounding out a number just above six, which took it out to 2024, to the end of that year. So you gained close to seven full years of additional Poseidon tenure compliance. So these are the key things that way beyond payback, we've got to continue to push forward and get the metrics, the banks and future charters with the EEOI, the close cousin, the AER, are going to rely on to fix the charters, for the most efficient ships, the best ships of the lot. And the older ships can improve their lot quite a bit. Next slide, please. So I think we'll pass it back to Kevin here. He can kind of touch on the uh, advantage of having Wartzilla as an early collaborator. Sure, thanks, John. Just as a, a last comment, um, what, what we're suggesting and what, what we're encouraging is, uh, whereas Wartzilla and, and OEMs and technology providers were often seen as, as sort of ancillary to the overall risk management profile of a, of a new build or a retrofit, uh, that we're seeing the key to this, this type of reduction of emissions is early collaboration between those providing the technologies and those with the financial risk profile. Very often owners are hesitant to invest capital if the charters are not willing to pay for it. Charters are hesitant to pay for it if they don't feel they're gonna get the performance. And the banks wanna make sure that their loans are appropriate risk profiles. And so we're suggesting that we can pool all that together with early collaboration with parties that arguably we haven't done a whole lot with in the past, but I think the future and these new requirements and the new regulations and just frankly our desire to improve the environment this type of early collaboration is going to be the model of the future. And I'll end it with that. Thanks, John. All right. Well, I think that then that leads us to the Q&A session for both of these. I'm going to go ahead and bring back Ali, Dr. Ali Sterling. And I'm going to actually start off with a couple of questions that came in early on for Ali. So, Ali, are you with us? I am. And look, I'll prove it. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Uh, oh, well. I need your webcam request. 
Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. You know, this technology no stuff, so I struggle with it. I got to. I really need the experts at Hartzilla to to help me out here. <laughs> uh, fantastic. All right. So now that you're here, um, a couple of quick fire questions for you back in your presentation. Um, the 50k for the membership was that per ship or per company? Per ship. Fantastic. Um, and. There was a chart that you had on, I believe it was the green screen. They were wondering, like, what bunker price do you assume in your model with the, I believe it was the MIT model that you had up? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to point out that uh, the the axis there uh, was fuel consumption, so tons per day. Uh, yeah. So, so that that uh, metric is is the fuel consumption. I think the you know the the volatility in the bunker price is a key risk factor. Uh, one reason why carbon credits are so important to the market today is that with bunker prices are low, and frankly, many people think we're on a trajectory for sustained low bunker prices. Uh, so we've got to see supplemental sources of, of revenue and as well as those cost savings in order to make those kinds of uh, benefits achievable. Uh, but that, 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 the metric there on that axis was uh, fuel oil consumption. Great, thanks for clearing that up. So, and then uh, and before we jump to Kevin, um, what has been the market's reaction today with regards to the, this Clean Co initiative? Um, what has been, you know, the reaction from banks, owners, and OEMs? Well, I'll, I'll be uh, quite honest. We've been thrilled uh, with the reaction. The 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 uh, uh, the owners that we talk to uh, want to dig into the details. I think it's fair to say that uh, every there's a, a lot of experts out there, uh, and and they all want to learn about the green screen and how that's uh, helping them. Uh, the key thing is really the conversations uh, we're having as well on the uh, on the financial side and with the commercial team uh, and the technical managers, and they're really seeing the, that this clean co service uh, uh, complements what they've got in place and really allows them to go forward with an innovative offering that 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 will bring business to them. So it's it's part of of uh, and, and complementary to their existing lines of business. And I, you know, maybe I should, I'd like to emphasize that right at the outset. The success of Clean Code depends on the innovative and, and, and pioneering work that the people uh, like we just saw here at, at Bartzilla are, are doing. Um, it, it is part of that collaboration uh, that is such an important slide, I think, Kevin and John, in your presentation, that this is an opportunity and, and the incentives to work together uh, to bring what are sometimes disparate and sometimes silo thinking uh, in a uh, style of, uh, in the industry uh, in a much more effective way to achieve real benefits in the short term. So is that, I, I love to see that collaboration slide. It's fantastic. And actually, you know, talking about collaboration, we had one question that kind of came in at the tail end of yours, Ali, and actually the beginning of your present, your talk track, Kevin. Um, and the question was, isn't slow steaming a cheaper temporary solution that will reduce emissions pending the introduction of the first zero emissions vessel? And I know that you talked a lot about slow steaming, so maybe you can both speak to a little bit about that. <clears throat> you, you want to take a crack first, Arlie? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, slow steaming's already been done. Uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a story from uh, ten years ago, almost. Uh, yeah, you can. Certainly, slow steam, uh, slow steam a little bit more. Uh, the benefits are largely uh, taken up now. Uh, we're operating at a margin of, you know, where the fuel consumption is already very low. So, um, and I, I think the the comments from John and, and Kevin on charter response to slow steaming are critical in that regard. Yeah, and I think also I, th I think the questioner asked in relation to zero carbon vessels. Um, I would certainly say there's no company more at the forefront of developing zero carbon fuels and engines and systems than, than Wartzilla. It is a difficult challenge. And, and, and for an owner to simply say, I'm going to wait for a decade, hope that I don't have to slow down to 35 percent, um, where, where now my charter costs, as, as if I'm a charter, my logistics cost, my, my time in transit goes up, my logistics chains now have not been geared to this. Um, it's 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 disruptive in a way that it's not not a good disruption, and so I, I think there's a limit on slow steaming. We're we're already seeing a lot of that's been squeezed out, as Arlie said. Um, all of our analysis assumes slow steaming is already happening. When we say 100%, we mean 100% of slow speeding logistic speeds, not design speeds. 
So I, that's already been sucked out for a big, big part. And and to simply wait and do nothing uh, as as we're working very hard to tackle the challenge, I, I don't think that's the answer for another decade. Okay. Thank John, you. John, maybe I could just uh, jump on that as, uh, well, sorry, John, uh, the other John with the H, <laughs> I interrupted. <laughs> just a quick thing, if you look back at our, our example, we had the vessel in today's market at 12 and a half knots laden, 11 and a half knots ballast, but it fell out of compliance in 2018. It fell out. So in 2021, it's got to go to 95% of those speeds, which means it's going 11.9 knots laden and 10.9 knots in ballast. Well, you won't be at the front of the line when the charter says, I want to go at my speed and you're the slow boat so you can wait. So your utilization is going to plummet. When they get to you, the charter say, well, I just took care of charting on the higher speed cleaner ships and gosh, you're going to take more time. I, my cost of inventory transit just went up. You aren't quite meeting my logistics need. So I'm going to give you a lower rate. Take it or leave it. Or I'll get to the next guy. So it's the spiral towards a real competitive disadvantage, plummeting utilization. And when you get a deal, a fix, it's a lower rate. That's not good for the economic life of your ship. And I think that was what we were trying to show in that one uh, key figure where we showed the red line with the speed falling off and the green line, because retrofits allow you to keep another six or so years of full charter revenues and utilization. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you for uh, elaborating on that. We had a question actually that came in, Kevin, early in on your, your uh, presentation, which you said, how does an RO verify the data in FOS? Um, how does who, who verify? How does an RO verify the data in FOS? <laughs> Ar Arlie, you, you have a comment or? Uh, uh, you, my uh, experience with the uh, first few weeks of the Poseidon, or the, the, the first Poseidon principles estimation period is it's not clear how the RO verifies the data in any case but uh, you can take it with FOS. Yeah, so, so the, the, the FOSS system um, develops a mathematical model of the vessel. Um, it's very sophisticated computer programming uh, using location, weather and wind at that actual moment in time. It's overlaid into the algorithms. We do use noon reports. We all know those are even under the best of intentions are not terribly accurate. But, but with computing power, you get a very, very accurate picture of the fuel consumption. So we're able to tell within certain bands of error, um, but we're able to tell that before and after very, very accurately with a methodology. This is the key. We have a methodology that has been examined and we, we I mean, we, you could share it to the extent that we need to show someone this is a legitimate way to determine the before and the after. That's why we have standards that we comply with. And that's really the key. Now, once that data exists, it, it, it could be reported to whoever the owner wants. I mean, if the owner wants the bank to know or, or, or wants anyone else to know, uh, uh, their charter, for example, on Sea Cargo Charter, that, that data can be reported automatically. The, the key is that initial before and after performance. And we believe that's, as a matter of fact, we, that's integral to what we're doing. We believe you have to be able to stand behind what you're doing. And, and as, a, as, as a provider that does all of that, that we have methodologies and technology that can say, hey, you got your money's worth out of this. And everyone in that risk group, banks, owners, and charters are comfortable with that. Great, thank you. Um, Ali, for you, where are the borders of the of Marsoft consultancy when it comes to technical items, to the owner side or to the vendor side? Well, I, I think uh, uh, the, the, to get back to the notion of, of, of a collaboration, what we've come to appreciate is, is the great skill and, and expertise that is uh, in the, uh, at the vendor side and uh, of the equation. It, and that includes the, those, the ROs and the others who do the evaluation. So we look to, to tap those skills and make them accessible to, for the owner. Uh, the, the, the reason we built the model with MIT and with the support of the High Tide Foundation is that we recognized that we had to, to provide that specialized expertise in a way that could be verified, could be understood, and, and, and people had complete confidence that we were translating 
manufacturer data into vessel performance in a reliable way that uh, they could easily, as, as, as we've heard here uh, earlier, that they could count on and could verify uh, using whatever mechanism they had. So it's um, really relying on that expertise that's in place in the industry now and, and, and building upon that to, to offer a, a, a more cost-effective service to the ship owner. Hey John, let me just add real quick, we believe that our system, our FOSS system, can provide that data that third parties like Marsoft or CoolFX that we heard on Monday, it would meet all their standards for carbon credits. So that, that's really a key point. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and Kevin, a, a question for you around a specific slide that I believe you presented. What was the amount of retrofit investment in the 2011 MR that yielded a 34% IRR? John, you want to you want to tackle that? Uh, the the estimate was nine hundred and seventy thousand dollars for those four items. Great. Um, and then just one other one for you guys is that in the two thousand eleven MR example, what retrofit measures have been modelled to estimate the thirty five hundred MT per year CO two savings? Also, how many steaming days have been estimated? The uh, green box, four items that we included were the weight flow, which was the uh, flow inducers and a, 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 a cap at the propeller with a trimming of the propeller back edge. That's the weight flow. The hull paint was a high performance hull paint. We don't manufacture paint, but we've found good public information that we've discovered on painting. Engine mods was basically blueprinting the, the engine, which most cases will be an MAN engine, not a Salzer Wurzel engine, and then for slow speed steaming. And then Fleet Digital is also in that green box, uh, was a part of the FOSS system that, that Kevin has reflected on. The uh, steaming days, I'd have to look at the upcoming article from Marine Money Magazine, where we'll be describing that. I believe it was 200 operating days a year. Fantastic. Thank you for that plug, John. Um, and so, okay, so we'll have we have time for one last question before we um, we have. I'm going to bring Jim back in, um, and we appreciate all the questions that have flowed in, and anything that wasn't uh, answered, I'll make sure that we forward on to the appropriate parties. But the last question is: the container market is tight. Are liner companies speeding up ships without concern about the increased emissions, or are they tempering their speeds? Who's that for, John? Um, so that was just an open question. I believe, um, Kevin, do you want to try, do you want to kick yeah, this one no, off? I mean, and then the... Anecdotally, right now, from, from my conversations in the industry, is, is they're maintaining full speeds. They are um, really packed right now for slots. So that, that's a reality of their marketplace right now. All right. Well, then, Jim, I'm going to hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, John, and thank you all very much. Uh, so while Batman and Robin were part of the Justice League with their fellow superheroes, I'd like to add Arlie to uh, perhaps Shipping's Climate League of Superheroes. So thank you guys very much for this. Um, and as I said on Monday, uh, you know, Marine Money fervently believes that the future for accessing finance, securing the best charters, and the support of shareholders and the uh, out underlying consumers uh, reside with those who lead in the uh, the efforts to mitigate climate change. So thank you very much. Now, finally, we hope you will all join us again Friday, December 18th, when committed bank and ship owner le leaders Lois Sabraki, Hugo DeStoop, Paul Taylor, Michael Parker, join moderator Watts, uh, from Watson Farley and Williams, Lindsay Keeble, in an informed discussion of just what the first year Poseidon Principles data released just the day before will mean for the future for ship owners, for borrowers, lenders, investors, and the climate. And once again, thank you all very much, Wartzilla, and to Marsov Cleanco. I really appreciate your efforts today and also for the broader good. Thank you. See you all. Stay well. Thanks, Jim. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Jim. Thanks. Bye-bye.